Hi, I'm Dan. I'm actually from Creative England. I'm getting Creative England's Games Associate and um, Creative Enterprise is a programme we run uh, through Creative England on behalf of the BFI. It's BFI funded. So um, for those who don't know what Creative England does, uh, we exist to provide creative businesses with the support they need to grow. So that's the, the broader creative sectors and obviously games important part within that. Um, so overseas trade investment, crucial elements to growth. Uh, so we're delighted to be supporting Yuki's uh, both US workshop today and next week's China edition too. So please sign up to that if you haven't done it already. Um, I'm sure it'll be hugely valuable advice given on both. Um, so we're supporting these events through the Creative Enterprise Programme, uh, which is funded by the BFI uh, to provide support specifically to storytelling screen businesses. So games within that. Um, and in terms of giving a flavour of what that, that support is from Creative Enterprise, it includes things, uh, funding, such so as New Ideas Fund, uh, which helps businesses to stimulate innovative thinking, or business support grants to pay for advice and services that you can um, that to shape your business plans. Um, but the main thing we're focusing on from a games point of view is providing dedicated game sector business support and advice through um, supporting programmes like this, but also creating and running um, uh, dedicated games programs in partnership with Yuki. So uh, the latest thing we've done is a dedicated game scale up uh, program, which uh, gives a cohort of games businesses access to expert dedicated game sector insights. So you know, stress and dedicated. This is this is you know, four games businesses uh, created by and for games businesses, um, uh, and you get advice from senior games industry speakers and experts. So the current cohort is just coming to an end. Uh, it's been a great success, lots of really senior industry figures supporting it. We're hoping to rerun the scale up and crucially we want a bit of that to be part of a wider expanded business support program for businesses of all sizes. So you know, we've got scale up, we want, we want accelerator for earlier stages business and support for businesses beyond scale up as well. So we'll be putting out more information about this in the next few months, but if you are interested, um, you probably haven't got my details, but go through Sam and Yuki as we're partnering with them. Uh, so please let them know if you're interested. And finally, the final webinar sponsor, I just wanted to mention that Creative England has, also has its um, Creative Growth Finance Fund, which, a very quick summary, um, it provides loans of up to 500,000 to games businesses looking to grow. So it's a really good opportunity if you are a games business with established revenue coming in and you need a cash boost to really uh, you know, grow your business, then uh, speak to us. Um, again, Luke, can pass, uh, sorry, Sam can pass on my details or look at the Creative England website so that's it that's a trade investment and that's, that's amazing thank you i will be um sending your details on to everyone afterwards two amazing okay. opportunities there and Wonderful. particularly keen to you know connect the trade work that we do to the scale up program it's a really nice program working in partnership in in harnessing that and getting people out to these international markets so thank you very much for your uh, ongoing support and I'll, I'll see you soon no doubt bye Wonderful, thanks. Um, moving on then, our first uh, presenter of the evening will be um, somebody I've never met before actually, Jeremy. I'd be delighted to hear, hear your talk representing Newzu, an amazing data company with really detailed knowledge of markets all around the world. So Jeremy, thank you very much for, for joining us this evening. I'll, um, I'll leave you to it. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's nice to meet you as well, Sam. Uh, so first I'll share my screen. Yeah, so uh, I hope everyone can see my screen. Uh, but thank you so much for joining tonight. Uh, we, I'll be running you through kind of an overview of the US games market. Uh, a little bit about myself, I'm Jeremy Jackson. I'm a market analyst over at Newzoo. Um, and I'm also from the United States and I am a gamer, which makes me especially qualified uh, to be giving this talk. Um, so first a bit about uh, Newzoo. Uh, we are the premier destination for games market insights. Uh, we track uh, data points across uh, gaming, esports, and mobile. And then we distribute those data points and insights to our clients via our platform, via our consumer insights, and our consulting, where we work with uh, some of the biggest endemic and non-endemic brands to kind of help them refine their video game-related strategy. Uh, we have a lot of great insights, great articles, and if you're interested in finding out more about that, you can of course check out uh, our website at newzoo.com. So yeah, as you know, today we'll be going over uh, the US games market. I'll run you through an overview of what the market looks like, um, as well as a bit on the impact of COVID-19 uh, on the games industry. Uh, not too much because I think that we've heard a lot about that so far in the past year. 
Uh, and then we'll be go over, going over some distribution and marketing related trends, uh, specifically around subscriptions and next gen consoles, the rise uh, of games as platforms and social medias, as well as the role of influencers in launching um, and uh, sustaining a game's health. So first of all, this is the US games market. Uh, at $41.3 billion. It is the second largest games market in the world. Uh, it's a close second to China in 2020. Uh, it also comes third and second uh, as far as number of players and payers go respectively. And as you can see, it has an online population of about 200, of, well, of 283.9 million, uh, which relative to its total population uh, is quite high when compared to some markets. Now, the thing that stands out the most about the US games market is the fact that console is by far its largest uh, revenue generating platform. Uh, now, this is kind of at odds with a lot of other markets. Uh, for example, the global games market in 2020 uh, saw mobile revenues generating 49% of the entire revenues for the year. Uh, and we see some Asian markets where uh, mobile revenues can make up shares greater than 90% sometimes. So the fact that the US is really a console first market uh, is quite interesting. Uh, and it sets it apart from a lot of uh, fast growing markets. But it's especially important to note that smartphones, uh, though they represent 26% of revenues, are growing the fastest out of any other segment at 30.7% year over year. Another interesting thing to point out is that gaming uh, in 2020 grew 21.3% year over year. Uh, and of course, that's been greatly accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and one other uh, kind of fun fact, since we're talking about the US being a console first market, uh, for the last generation of consoles, Xbox was the dominant um, console between Xbox and PlayStation. Um, and this is at odds with a lot of other markets where Sony's PlayStation is quite popular. Now, uh, this is very telling, but of course it's, um, it's not to be uh, assumed that the next generation of consoles will do the same. Uh, now, when we're looking at US gamers specifically, we see that 48% uh, of US gamers are women. Um, and uh, when we look at the age demographics, uh, we see that actually the adult uh, age group is the uh, strongest. Um, now this kind of goes against the stigma that most gamers are under the adult age, uh, but in reality we see a lot of strength in the adult age groups um, and some really, really good strength uh, in the above 51 age group. On top of that, 47% of US gamers are full-time employees, 38% live with their partners and, and have kids at home, and 62% have an average to high income. So of course, especially when compared to um, the total online population, US gamers are a really attractive target group for uh, brands and companies. Uh, now looking at uh, the kind of segmentation split uh, for how many players uh, play on, on plat different platforms, we see that 53% of US players uh, in 2020 played on all three platforms. Uh, and when we break it down to the individual platforms, we actually see that mobile is the strongest with 14% uh, of US players being mobile only. Now, of course, uh, this kind of contradicts what we discussed previously with, um, with mobile not being the largest revenue generator, but it's important to uh, note that uh, the spend per player is a lot larger on PC and console in the US. Uh, and the US has a very high spend per player, uh, which means that even though those, those platforms are a little less represented, uh, they're still able to be a lot stronger in revenues. So moving on to the trends, uh, COVID-19, of course, uh, has had a massive impact on the games industry uh, with everybody locked away at home. Uh, what we see is that um, uh, a lot of added revenues um, uh, occurred. Uh, actually, we revised our initial forecast for the 2020 global games uh, revenue, uh, and we added 15.6 billion at the end of last year. Uh, so that just goes to show the growth in revenues. And actually, uh, those revenues totaled up to uh, 175 billion generated in the global games market uh, in 2020, which is almost a 20% year over year growth. But of course, uh, COVID-19 has been a bit of a double-edged sword uh, for the games industry, uh, with development of video games taking an especially large hit. 
Um, in a survey that Newsroom conducted in July, we found that 46% of developers had actually um, had COVID-19 negatively impact their development. And the GDC State of the Industry 2020 survey found that uh, one third of developers uh, reported working on a game that had been delayed. Um, and this, uh, these delays have already started to affect games in 2020, uh, but we'll mostly see those delays in 2021. And some really important launch titles uh, for uh, the next generation of consoles were actually delayed, such as uh, the new Halo uh, and Deathloop, which was supposed to be a PlayStation uh, exclusive. So uh, the new consoles actually didn't have um, as many uh, launch titles, uh, which uh, was actually uh, initially assumed to potentially uh, damage their launches. Uh, but we've, what we've seen is that next-gen consoles have actually met sales expectations and they've matched uh, last-gen's launch figures. So the PlayStation 5 has shipped 4.5 million units and the Xbox Series S slash uh, X has, has uh, shipped 3.5 million units. And uh, if you know anybody who is currently trying to get one, uh, you'll know that the demand is extremely high, remains extremely high for all of these platforms. Uh, and they're still really hard to get your hands on them. So even though there have been a lot of disruptions uh, from COVID-19, we still see a lot of really, really heightened demand for next generation uh, hardware. And uh, one interesting thing about next generation hardware that we'll likely see um, has been a trend that's been developing for a long time and was greatly accelerated by COVID-19. And that is mainly the shift from physical to digital um, sales. Now, when we look at these uh, charts of physical versus digital full game console revenues in the US, we see that uh, physical full game revenues uh, shrunk from 66% in 2016 to 51% in 2019. And when I say full game uh, revenues, this means no uh, microtransactions or DLC, things like that, uh, really just the base game. Uh, 2020 actually saw the uh, share of digital full game revenues grow to 62%. Um, and this trend will likely continue to accelerate, um, strongly assisted by next, gen ne next generation consoles, which both have digital only alternatives, which are also cheaper and reducing the barriers to entry. Uh, and we're also seeing both console manufacturers expand on their digital subscription services greatly. Um, it's important to also state that uh, digital um, sales are much more beneficial to uh, console manufacturers because as they own the storefronts, uh, they can also dictate things like price and they don't have to compete with a secondhand market for game sales. Uh, our next trend also was accelerated by COVID-19 though it's safe to assume that COVID-19 had a, a huge effect on almost every gaming related trend this year but it's a shift towards uh, kind of more uh, higher engagement uh, video games. Um, and games are increasingly becoming kind of immersive social experiences, which are more similar to social media than what we typically have, cons can have thought of uh, as, as games. Um, and what we saw was that um, with everybody locked away at home, uh, certain games really capitalized on, on kind of being these social platforms. Uh, we saw Fortnite um, make, uh, include a mode called Party Royale, which uh, is, is still a mode today. Um, and it emphasizes more social experiences and hanging out with your friends rather than the traditional um, kind of Battle Royale shooter mode that they've had, that they've been uh, popularized for. Um, and we see on the right, a chart that goes over some of the live events that have taken place within these games. Uh, both Fortnite and Roblox are featured here but these live events are either movie events or musical performance, but there have been a lot of other events since then. And we see that even on streaming platforms that are not the native platforms for these events, we're seeing massive amounts of engagement. Uh, so these kind of social experiences and these live events are growing increasingly important. Um, and, uh, and for brands and creators, this is gonna become part of their marketing strategies. Uh, virtual events uh, are a win-win because they bring a lot of engagement to the platform uh, and they also elevate the artist brands and we've seen that they can be quite lucrative. Uh, Travis Scott, who is a rapper, uh, is said to have generated $20 million in two days uh, by doing a Fortnite live event. Uh, we're also seeing brands getting involved with branded skins where players can represent their interests, such as football or Nike, while elevating the brand perception and awareness for 
uh, for brands who are, are targeting um, audiences that are increasingly difficult to reach. So through this, they can really just be uh, engaging with them on their screens. And of course, IP injection. So we're seeing crossover between other video games, movies, and television shows who are really uh, clinging on to these games as platforms to find ways to generate more awareness and more interest in their actual IPs. Uh, and finally, we're going to look at uh, influencers and their effects on game launches and long-term health. Uh, so um, influencer-driven driven launches are nothing new, uh, but they're going to become increasingly important. And we've seen this really this year, especially as uh, kind of physical launch events have been restricted. Uh, but this case study is incredibly interesting because uh, Apex Legends, which launched in uh, February of 2019, um, had been built with streamers in the development process in order to make the game kind of as streamable as possible. Uh, and on its launch, these streamers also were on contract to help generate interest in the game's launch. And what we saw was that uh, viewership for the game was uh, at 120 million live hours watched for the month of February. Um, and this coincided with the adoption from players uh, because uh, 25 million players actually joined the game in its first week, which is absolutely insane. Now, of course, there is a big risk to uh, these kind of influencer-driven launch events because you see that viewership uh, drops off to a much more organic level uh, after the initial month, which was mostly uh, through paid streaming, which then generated a lot of organic streaming. Uh, but because it drops off, it could give a perception that interest in the game is uh, is uh, decreasing. Uh, but at the end of the day, a game averaging about 20 million to 30 million live hours watched per month is still incredibly strong. Uh, and um, from 2019, Apex Legends is really one of the Battle Royale games that was able to rival PUBG uh, and Fortnite. So I think all in all, their strategy really paid off. And that's why we'll continue to see influencer-driven launches uh, becoming more and more important. And it's not just launches, because we're also seeing uh, influencer-driven marketing playing a bigger role in maintaining uh, multiplayer title health. Um, so they can do this in many different ways, but we'll look specifically at Twitch drops and a game called Escape from Tarkov. So Twitch drops are events that happen on streaming platforms where viewers of a stream can unlock in-game events. Uh, obviously, this benefits streamers who activate this feature, and it also benefits, benefits viewers. But what we see is that not only does viewership interest in the games increase when there are Twitch drop events happening, which is, you might say, obvious because they have actually something physical or uh, virtual to gain, uh, but we also see uh, spikes in monthly active users increasing uh, on the same curves. So these types of, uh, of kind of influencer-driven uh, events are going to continue to be mainstays for uh, maintaining the health of multiplayer and live service titles. Anyway, uh, those are all my trends and insights for today. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you've uh, learned a thing or two. And we have so many more other great insights available on our platform at newzoo.com. So thanks so much for joining. Jeremy, that was um, fascinating. And, and, and like I said, we haven't met before. It's always, it's always nervous when you have someone new doing a talk. That was yeah. sensational. Thank you. It was yeah. beautifully flow and, and really stuck to those, those key insights. You know, these, these are the things we really want to know. So I'm going to put you on the spot with a couple of awkward questions, if that's all right. So, yeah, please. Um, but feel free to just throw them back at me. I mean, you, you mentioned um, before about in the previous generation that Xbox really performed far better in the United States than it had done in other markets when you compare to, to PlayStation. What's the early signs on the current generation, the latest generation of consoles? How's that looking? So it's a bit hard to say, um, mostly because um, uh, it's the numbers are really early. Uh, and it's hard to make assumptions because I think people right now, especially, are really just trying to get whatever they can get their hands on. Um, and of course, um, the demand is so high that, uh, that the console manufacturers would have acted closer to what they might have expected launch results to, to be. So right now, it's still really hard to tell, and I'm not going to make any guesses. But um, I, I will say that what is really impressive about Microsoft is that their strategy has become much more global this generation, 
uh, and much more about accessibility. So the consoles are more part of their greater kind of service <laughs> ecosystem at this point. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see Microsoft uh, making more, taking more ground kind of globally. Okay, thank you for that. And, uh, and again, I know it's difficult. I don't want you to make predictions. That's not really what you do. You're a data company, you rely on factual evidence, but there's insight that you can draw from that. You referenced quite a few times the, the boost that the sector got uh, through the times of the, the, the pandemic. Now, you know, fingers crossed, we might be heading in the right direction finally in that. And, and at some point in this year, we might feel like things are getting back to normal. What are your expectations on thoughts on where the games market is going to be <coughs> heading then? Going to return to some of the sort of the pre-pandemic levels or do you feel that we have built up a certain sort of following and traction here that is just continuing in the future where do you think we're going it, it's really hard to say uh i think it'll be a bit of both right i mean obviously there are some some people who have picked up gaming as a way to be interested uh, to, to keep themselves interested while at home and um and they might uh, go back to uh kind of being non-gamers um or lapsed gamers as we say but uh, I think um, overall, we're really seeing that society is changing entirely uh, with this pandemic, uh, the way that we treat kind of the digital world, um, our relationship with the digital world has evolved a lot. And um, like I said, with kind of Xbox's strategy, I think that um, lately games have become really more about access and have become kind of a very pleasant and easy hobby to jump into with competitive titles not being the only way to go. Uh, and indie titles really kind of um, getting uh, these new chances with ser services like Game Pass. Uh, so it's possible that some people have really just found new hobbies and, and they'll stick to them. But I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see. But I totally agree with you that games companies seem to be doing all the right things at the moment to keep those consumers engaged. So hopefully we won't lose too many of those uh, players to other forms of entertainment, uh, particularly as they get more harmonized and closer together. So that's wonderful. Th thank you for that. If anyone has any more questions for, for Jeremy, please pop them in the Q&A and Jeremy will try and answer them uh, through text or we'll deal with them uh, at a later stage. But thank you very much for that, Jeremy. Yeah. Great start to this evening. Yeah, um, thank you. I'd like to um, welcome Bill. I was about to say to the stage. It's not really to the stage, but I'd like to welcome Bill onto the screen now from, from Skystone Games. So, uh, Bill, delighted to have you here. I'm a, a, a big fan of your previous work and you came to the UK in the past and, and had a look around and met some great companies. So um, great to be reconnected with you. And thank you for taking the time to do a talk this evening. So over to you, take it away. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for having me. Let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, cool. <clears throat> well, thank, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Bill Wang from Skystone Games. Uh, Skystone is a San Francisco Bay Area based publisher of multi platform games. Uh, the company was started in April 2020 by David Bravik, the creator of Diablo, and myself. So, despite the challenges caused by pandemic, we were able to raise funding from VC investor and signed with five uh, developers so far. So I'm going to walk you through our approach and what we can do for developers. Okay, so we are a player first and developer focused global multi-platform gaming company. For player first, it's pretty easy to understand we are in the entertainment business. We believe if we build a great experience for players, they will tell each other about it. And word of mouth is very powerful. For developers focused um, in this industry, content is king. Developers are the most important assets. So we treat, player, we treat developers well and help them make better titles. Next, I'll talk to you about my background and my partner, David Bravik's background. So for myself, I've been in the industry for 15 years. Before I started Skystorm with David, I spent most of my career with Chinese publishers. I helped establish 
uh, U.S. office for two Chinese publishers, uh, Giant and Profile World. So at Giant and Profile World, I publish games on PC, console, and mobile. For example, um, in 2008, when I moved to the States from China, we published a game called Profile World in National. It's one of the first successful MMOs from Asia. At the peak, we were able to make $3 million revenues a month. And later, we also published now winter Star Trek on PC and console. They became the top grossing titles on PS4 and Xbox One. Uh, we also published a mobile game called The Puzzles Wager. It's a Dark Souls style action RPG game. The game was showcased at the Apple special event in September 2019. So when, that's when iPhone 11 was announced. So that's the first time a developer from Asia, I mean from China, to get that game showcased by Apple. Besides publishing, I also have, uh, I also have very fortunate to work with very talented developers in the past. For example, I invested in a small developer called Runic in 2008. Later, they launched Torchlight franchise. For Torchlight 1 and Torchlight 2, we sold over 8 million copies on PC and console. I made a small team in San Francisco called Unknown Wars when they have only six guys in 2012. And I like them, I invested in the team and acquired them later. The team launched Subnautica, a very popular uh, exploration game on PC and the console. They sold over 8 million copies. So that's a big success for indie game. I also work with big platforms. For example, I brought Dota 2 and CSGO to China. So I've been working with Valve for over uh, 10 years. My partner, David Bravik, is well known in the industry. He is best known for the, being the creator of Diablo. And he founded uh, Blizzard North. And later, he also founded Flagship Studios. Before Skystone, David spent two and a half years building uh, a indie game by himself, the studio called Great Beard. And uh, the game has sold well on PC and the console. So David did everything by himself. So David not only have experience running big studios with hundreds of employees, but also as an indie developer himself. Besides David and myself, we have a publishing team in the Bay Area. So we provide uh, PR, marketing, community management, platform relations, and the production support to our partners. So in today's market, it's very difficult to succeed compared to like 10 years ago. Why? The first issue is discoverability. Well, today it's very competitive as over 1,000 titles released across all the platforms per month, per week. And uh, it's very difficult for a developer to get any attention from players from platforms. Second thing is that with the, you know, the easy to use the, the development tool like Unity Engine and Unreal Engine, the entry barrier for development getting much lower than before. So a lot, lot of new studios and many new developers don't know how to create community, and how to market their titles. Or some studios are small, they don't have resources to do that. So that make them more difficult to get attention from players. The third thing about the feedback um, during development, many developers don't know how that game will be played like by players. So uh, they have no feedback from uh, experienced professionals, uh, from dedicated fans. And uh, even they launched that game, uh, they don't know how to position that game and how to market that game to their target users. So that could make or break the success of our title. With all the gaps, we believe we can help out. We have a very different business model from many uh, companies in the industry. Our goal is to build an ecosystem 
with a network of 20 studios and worldwide multi-platform publishing capability. For development, uh, we not only provide publishing services to developers, we also give them capital so that they can spend more time on publishing their content. We also give them creative guidance. That's the key for our success. Uh, my partner, David Bravik, had built a billion dollar franchise, Diablo. He also spent you know, years building game back himself. So he understands development inside and out. So he can provide creative guidance. He know how to make games fun. So with our support, developers can make games better, and can make games more fun. Also, as the way we work with more developers down the road, we want to create a network of studios so that we can share know-how, share the best practice among our partners. So by working together, by sharing know-how together, we can help each other getting better and be more successful. As for publishing, um, we press support to developers in the form of creative feedback and marketing exposure to allow titles to reach beyond their goals. We have a network of influencers, um, uh, media allies, so we can have the get exposure to this key audience. Uh, and also, besides media outlets and influencers, we have strong relationship platforms. As I mentioned, I brought Dota 2 and Sets Go to China years ago. So we have strong relationship with Valve uh, on the Steam platform. I also work with Epic Management Team in the past. And uh, for my team, we published games on all the platforms in the past. So we know all the key platforms. We can help them get featured by platforms. So in summary, with our personal reputations, relationship with platforms, and history of hit games, we can stand out among other, play other publishers. So here's a summary of our, our pillars, how we approach publishing and development. The first one is talent first. As I said, talent is the most important asset in this industry. We treat people well. Second thing, uh, multi-platform approach. Uh, based on the success of PUBG, Fortnite, we believe going multi-platform is the best way to maximize returns and reach out to as many players as possible. The third thing, uh, me call to hardcore, uh, we stick to what we know the best. Uh, over the past you know, years, we have published games on micro and hardcore genres. Um, we don't know much how to market and promote hyper casual titles. So we stick to what we know the best. The first thing is about low development cost. Uh, we are based in the Bay Area. We know how expensive it could be to have a studio here. That's one of the reasons we didn't start a studio by ourselves. We want to work with developers around the world. We want to help them succeed, no matter where they're from. Uh, the fifth thing is about the uh, effective PR and influencers' courage. Um, we have been working with all the PR agencies and over uh, hundreds of influencers in the past. For example, when we uh, launched Pascal's Wager uh, over a year ago, we got uh, free coverage from over 100 influencers. They have over 30 million uh, subscribers on their YouTube, Twitch, and other channels. The sixth thing, the sixth thing is about be fair and candid. Um, trust is the key to build success among parties. Um, we want to have a great reputation in industry. We want to treat people fairly, and we always be candidate with our partners. We want to share risk and return with them. So here's a quick summary of our current projects. So Undying is a survival game made by a studio in China. So the game will launch on PC, console, and the mobile as well. Um, I have been working with studio for over two years. 
and uh, it's great again and got attention from um, platforms and uh, influencers. Uh, the game was streamed at the recent um, Steam Festival and it was number one most streamed titles there. It also won the best indie game award for Unity last November. And this game was launched in Q2 this year. Space and Crew made by studio in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So it's a cooking, uh, overcooked style adventure game. So you play with your friend together. Um, the last friend made by studio in uh, El Salvador is the first uh, PC and console game studio there. Uh, it's a game about dogs. You try to save dogs uh, by playing a tower defense and fighting. Um, Underworld Dreams, made by a studio in Spain. Actually, it basically made by one person. So he's very talented, someone like David Bravik. He did most of the things by himself. And this horror game will be launched in Q3 this year. Boundary is the most high profile title in our portfolio. It's a space shooter and got our attention from um, media influencers and platforms. Um, the quality is so high that right? uh, you know the game will be launched on all the new next gen platforms like PS5 and the Xbox uh, X series. If you Google it, you can see many trailers uh, boundary and uh, the trailer we launched on IGN got over uh, 300,000 views. So let's quick summary about Skystone. We're a next-gen game company built for global audiences. So we publish games not only in the West, but also in Asia. Um, going forward, we want to publish uh, five to eight titles a year. So if you are a developer, you are looking for support from a publishing partner, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I list my email address there. You can also go to our website, Games, to get latest update about our company. So that's quick presentation and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. So now I go to Sam. Yeah, Bill, thank you very much for that presentation. And, um, you know, I've been keeping an eye on the progress of Skystone and you, so, you signed some amazing games there, I have to say, some, some fabulous games. Um, just a very quick sort of personal question, given, given your and David's background and experience, was it not tempting to set up another developer yourself and try and build your own games? It's interesting that you've, you've gone for the publishing route. Yeah, so when we started Sky's Doom, we want to help developers succeed by leveraging our resources. Build, instead of building our own studio, which is time consuming and also very expensive, you know, in the Bay Area, the month rate could be over $15,000 per month. That's too expensive. So yeah, yeah, instead of yeah. doing focus on our own studio, we want to help as many developers succeed as possible. So that reason, uh, we have been working with developers in Asia, Europe, and the uh, Americas. We want to help as many developers as possible. In the future, we want to have a network of over 50 developers so that we can help each other. So create network effects. Yeah, it's a, a really interesting model of the way that you're trying to get the developers to, in effect, support each other and learn from each other. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting in model, especially when you look at the location of the studios that you're working with, China, Brazil, El Salvador. I mean, these companies are all over the place. Have, have you had a look at the UK? What do you think of our games development talent in the UK? Well, actually, before the pandemic, my last international trip was to the PG Connect in London back to January 2020. Um, so over a year ago, so I've been to UK many times and talked to many UK developers. For example, I've been to um, Bosa Studios, uh, looking to uh, Jagex for potential acquisition, and uh, um, I've been to Impossible.io before. <laughs> so right, I, yeah, I know a lot yeah. of UK developers. Uh, definitely, yep. it's our goal to work with developers around the world, especially in the UK, 
and the UK government offer a very generous tax rebate for development. It's great support for developers there. So if you have a chance, we love to work with UK-based developers. One thing I forgot to mention that instead of building our own studios, we want to provide publishing support to them, to studios around the world. And in the future, we also want to invest and acquire studios as well, as we have done at uh, Runic and the worst and the double damage, and also um, the studios behind Now Winter and uh, Star Trek. That's another thing we want to do. So we want to create long-term partnership with studios. So instead of doing our own studio, we want to invest in studios and acquire them down the road so we can become one family. Okay, that's lovely. Um, there's a couple of questions in the in the chat. Um, Ronnie's asked about whether you're taking submissions for games at the moment. I think you answered that, saying that you're looking for six to eight games and you've you've set your store out in that sort of mid-core, hardcore area. So I'll make sure that we um, connect you to all of the people who are um, at the event here so they can send their details over to you. You know, we'd obviously love you to come and look at some of the up-and-coming UK studios, but also studios across Europe, you know, where it's important to bring bring these people together. Um, but a question you, Andrew. There was a, a couple of questions in the in the Q&A, one from Andrew actually saying um, you, you, you thought the game suffered from poor feedback loops. What's the basis for that? for that belief? Why do you think that happens? Okay, well, for many uh, small developers, um, they have not much experience on getting feedback from uh, professional developers, other developers, and they, they, they don't know how to show that again to media outlets, uh, to uh, reporters or to influencers. That's the reason we talk about the feedback loop. Uh, if you build begin by just by itself in the one room, you know, you don't know how the game will look like, how the market will look like in one year or two. So I think continuous feedback will be helpful for developers. So they can correct any potential issues during development instead of showing the game to the public, then they realize, oh, I made a mistake. <laughs> I didn't have time to credit it before launch it. <laughs> so that's what I talk about the feedback loop. And with our support, we talk to developers regularly, we play our test build, we play our build and give them feedback. So not only my team, you know, we have our, we have, most of my team members have been in three for over 10 years. They play a lot of games <laughs> all the yeah, time. Yeah. So that's we know how to that, get the games better and what market think, wants. That's exactly right. That experience is going to be exceptionally useful. I want to just one final question, just on the general status looking at the American market in particular where you've been now for a period of time. We hear that, that globally video games have had a very good 2020. Uh, I yeah. wonder from your experience on, on sort of an investment landscape, do you think, uh, what's your view on sort of the general consensus from the investment community about investing in games? Do you think that there's been a change in attitude in the last couple of years? Well, I <laughs> When we start Scarce Doom um, in April, maybe that's the worst time <laughs> to raise funding <laughs> because people now were, were really worried about the pandemic. <laughs> they didn't know what would happen in the future, what happened to the economy. But after uh, June, I would say um, it could not be better for, to raise funding from investors. We see a lot of acquisitions and investment new developers in the past um, seven to eight months. So the timing is great. Uh, gaming is one of those silver linings during the pandemic. We see tremendous growth in the industry. Most of games report really strong growth in the past year. And um, when you stay home, you have nowhere to go. Playing game together with your friends could be the, <laughs> the best thing you can do as a social activities. Um, so yeah, we, we believe in the industry. And uh, that's the reason uh, we always look for uh, potential studios we can work with. We can work with them as a publishing partner and also invest in them as an investor. So we're really open-minded. I'm pretty sure uh, over the past years that many new uh, investment funds set up for gaming startups. So if you are game studios, yeah, timing could not be better. Wonderful. And thank you for those positive words. Let's hope we can keep this going. And, and Yuki will be here to connect lots of interesting studios 
to your business. You know, we have big faith in what you can do and we'll be sending plenty of companies your way. So thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we're now thank going you. to move on to um, our, our final speaker of this evening, who um, is Luke Fokker, who works over at Informa and Gama Sutra. Um, I was discussing Luke's um, incredible tan earlier. I don't want to keep mentioning it, but it just makes me feel so pasty and English in this. It's terrible. But uh, Luke, really, really pleased that you can join us uh, here this evening. I think you brought a colleague with you as well. because we've got, Yes. So we can, um, Leon, if you can um, open the, the microphone and the camera for the, the other Luke. Um, <laughs> Which is not my alter ego, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we should all have... We should all have an alter ego. That would be amazing. <laughs> um, well, Luke, thank you very much for joining us here this evening. I'm going to leave you to uh, take it from here. So thank you. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, Sam, thanks a lot for having me and everybody for yeah spending the time with us. Um, as mentioned, I quickly introduced uh, myself and uh, while well, the other Luke, which is, uh, first of all, Nick Geist, who is the sales director uh, on, uh, with Informa Tech for the entertainment group. Nick, maybe you can add a few more things to that. Before. Yes, uh, yeah, it's very nice to meet you all, Sam. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with Luke. Um, and uh, we, we, we're here just to really discuss um, ways in which to connect uh, you all to our, our game developer audience via Gama Sutra, uh, which is our website, as also through our events. And um, just as always, I think very pleased and uh, appreciate the ongoing partnership uh, from Yuki and uh, excited with what we have uh, planned for the year ahead and uh, and taking it from there. Yes, thanks Nick. So <clears throat> yeah, as mentioned, my name is Luke. Uh, just quickly that you know who's talking to you. Uh, I'm the sales manager for GDC events uh, and for, um, for Gamma Zutra, obviously. Uh, I'm based out of Frankfurt, Germany, so with regards to communicating, we're in pretty similar time zones, which makes life much more easier, I suppose. I will jump into the presentation and the information that I have. And uh, do you see my screen? Not yet. Sorry. Not yet. One second. Excuse me. Why is that not working? See it now? Yes. Yes. Okay, so yeah, so uh, today uh, I want to take you to uh, Gamma Sutra, which is our website. And it's been around for 25 years now, for more than 25 years actually. And it has always been historically in the case supporting the game developers community. Uh, usually supporting community, stay in touch, stay engaged from a business perspective throughout the year and not only limited towards uh, the events, uh, GDC events, as mentioned, that we run as well. And especially obvious, for obvious reasons in the last year, there has been a change where, of course, as we all know, the in-person events are not taking, have not been taking place. And unfortunately uh, for the next few months will also not be taking place. They go all virtual. So there was a big demand. And that's what I want to kind of like outline why, um, why I think it's a great opportunity now to also look at options in the online and the virtual world to engage with the community because uh, you guys still develop great products. You have like great games, you have great stories to tell. Uh, you still need to get those messages out and you still want to partner up, find new opportunities for partnerships, find new tools or want to present tools. And that is pretty much what Gamma Zutra can currently help you out with. What we did when like looking at the new products and offerings at Gamma Zutra was what are companies looking for when attending in-person events, which is usually it's either brand awareness, lead generation, or position themselves as a thought leader in the field. And within the next couple of slides, I want to walk you through, give you some information on the audience profile on what Gamma Zutra is, how we attract the audience, how we drive traffic to the website, and then of course show you some opportunities on uh, that are meeting your goals and serving the needs that you want to uh, that you want to uh, transport. So as mentioned, Gamma Zutra uh, has been around like for close to 25 years now. 
Uh, we are have like an editorial team that is take, constantly taking care of the new content uh, going on, publishing news, keeping uh, the community engaged, keeping the users coming back to our website. And it's all about gaming. And um, that is very, because we get like quite a few questions. If it's also about like the gambling side, which we obviously don't do. It is, if you want to look at Gamma Sutra, it is your virtual platform. It is your virtual GDC, let's put it that way. If you want to look at the audience. And also, uh, just to add some, we, as you probably know, who uh, already attended GDC events, we always do a survey and we have always have like a question which um, information sources they need, they are looking uh, using. And we have like a very big overlap with more than 72% of our GDC users say that they're frequent Gamma Sutra readers as well. So there's a good, good opportunity if we, as unfortunately we're not be able or not having like a Yuki in-person booth as there's no in-person event at GDC 2021. Uh, but if you still want to engage with the community there, talk to the people, you will find them on Gamma Sutra. Nick, is there anything you want to add at this point? No, I, I mean, I think that, that that's a great uh, way to segment it into, uh, which is in general, I think when you look at Gamma Sutra, we, we, we are a new site in many ways that is uh, really trying to cover all things related to the development of games. Uh, so we cross all different business disciplines uh, that all sort of go into the uh, creation of games um, and, and really try to serve as a, a touch point of news and uh, up, updated information. So, um, you know, I think as Luke said, as we'll dive into the audience in the next slide, I mean, that, that one of the more compelling things uh, with Gamma Sutra in general is the fact that um, there is a high overlap with our GDC audience. Um, it is, uh, to some degree, uh, the naming of Gamma Sutra has always been a little bit of a challenge in the marketplace, as, as it is not always a, a natural uh, for people to think of the connection between Gamma Sutra and GDC. Um, and so, uh, you know, just to let you guys know confidentially, we are working on some plans for uh, a rebranding of the site uh, this year as well. So uh, just with the name being more clarified and more directly connected to game development uh, versus our more, uh, you know, a vague name to some degree of Gamma. Um, but specific to the audience here, um, I think we just wanted to really highlight you know, this is a very involved audience that's going to run the gamut of those people who are, um, you know, really have been in the game development community or industry for a long time. So we have very senior level veteran uh, folks, people, folks uh, who have been involved with game development throughout their career, um, as well as we have uh, sort of your uh, up and coming developers as well. Uh, people who are either, you know, students or uh, new to the industry and are just starting their career. Uh, we offer a lot of different ways for them to jumpstart their careers, to provide information on uh, how to, uh, you know, uh, elevate their career within the game industry and uh, provide insights for them across throughout the year and throughout our platform. So um, across the board, uh, the disciplines of our audience, you know, range from game designers to engineers, all the way down to artists, animators, to students in universities and whatnot. And then in terms of the actual specific um, uh, platforms, you can see sort of the, the area of focus, uh, I think, which matches in many ways uh, a lot of what we saw earlier with Jeremy, uh, his presentation on his research as well. But uh, we're definitely seeing an uptick in um, more on the mobile side of things, obviously, uh, consistently around PC and Mac has always been a very strong field. Um, and then really keeping a close eye on our handheld uh, console development as we proceed. Um, the only other thing I really would want to highlight specific to the audience is, is our reach here in terms of being uh, primarily, um, you know, we're, we're a nice mix uh, of an international uh, platform. So about 50% of it is North America based, um, USA and Canada. Uh, and then we really have been uh, expanding um, greater and greater into our European markets, our APAC markets, um, as well as a few others. So um, the, the, the brand itself is definitely growing, which is nice. We have had a strong foothold in the industry for the last 25 plus years um, and just continue to look to build off of that and actually elevate the brand even further. Yes, <clears throat> yes. Thank, thank you, Nick, for those uh, further insights. 
And um, adding to that, I mean, uh, as mentioned, as uh, Sam already mentioned, you will receive all those slides uh, post, um, post presentation. So I don't want to go, go through every digit. But what I want to outline here is on this next slide, on the next slide is, um, and I really want to um, make that, uh, uh, you aware of that, that the, the scope of pur purchase involvement, uh, because that's usually what uh, the question that we get a lot of times, like, well, do I reach the right decision makers? And if you look at the, um, the stats on the left-hand side, and where, uh, where people are all involved in the decision-making process. And then see that people at over 40, that 42% mentioned that they're uh, <clears throat> in, uh, involved in the investment process. I think that's already a pretty good statement um, to, to make that you, yes, you do reach the people you want to um, reach uh, with, uh, with your message that you're posting out on Gamma Sutra in various ways. And to those various ways, I just want to, uh, want to uh, um, blend into right now. And um, as mentioned earlier, we looked at uh, when <clears throat> um, when now the COVID situation came in and we've seen like, okay, there are virtual events, but there has to be other ways and enhanced ways. And actually that was uh, kind of like a feedback and the demand that we heard from our customers who said like, well, fine, now we don't have like an, a GDC event going on, but we have like great stories to tell and we want to get leads and I want to get in front of the, uh, the audience. We really looked at our in-person products and the offerings that we had there and uh, thought like, how can we transfer them to uh, on the virtual world? And as you're all familiar with, uh, or those of you from being familiar with GDC, it's very content centric. So is Gamma Sutra. And a lot of things uh, is about the thought leadership process where you have the ability to have like a sponsored talk. So that was like, pretty much the first question that we got, like, how do I get my message out? How can I uh, generate like leads? And so we launched and we just launched it last year and it's already very successful, like a lead generation pro uh, products, like with webinars. And then we have like two options and I don't want to get too much into the details, but there's like one option where you're in full control of the, <clears throat> of the content and you have it like kind of like a, a classroom style. So we said like, okay, well, there's like a new product, want to demonstrate and take it from there or you can even we also have like an editorial product where we have like an editor talking about a topic of course in uh, in discussion in line with you what you want to reach and then have like more like a vendor neutral approach so and of course you will receive all the contact details and all the um, leads to follow up on which is like a great great opportunity another thing uh, which uh, which i just want to uh, don't want to repeat for every product that i'm presenting now and edit every solution that we're offering is that um you have to always also consider that when looking at these options in a virtual world like on gamma sutra and i'm not especially not uh, talking about like a virtual conference like all these programs are exclusive for the time being. That meaning is uh, a website like Gamma Sutra uh, does not run like two or three web, uh, webinars simultaneously. And there's like also a whole line of promotion to it to get like the awareness. And there's like a, a lot of marketing to it. And uh, so and, and communication on social media, which is all included and which is like a turnkey package. So basically, uh, it's all included in the in, in this uh, solution and you kind of like deliver the content and you're good to go and you're not like saying okay well I have this session like which could happen at an in-person event or at a virtual event as well we said okay well I have like this great speaking opportunity I have like this great slot hmm. but at the same time um, it happened a few years ago uh, Stadia Google announces a launch of Stadia at the keynote speak so that is like a tough competition um, or it used to be a tough competition back in the day. Um, yeah, so that is just an example of a webinar to generate leads. Nick, if you could maybe give a little bit of insights about like our native advertisers. Yes, by all means. I mean, and, and I think with all these programs, whether it be our webinars, our, our editorial webinars, content syndication, it's about taking your mission, your message and bringing it to our audience. And uh, we're fully armed to do the marketing and outreach. We have great uh, data on our audience in general. Uh, and in the last couple of 
uh, I'd say in the last year, we've seen an incredible uptick with our webinars in general and the response rates. Whereas uh, in the prior years, we might have gotten, you know, anywhere between maybe, you know, 50 or so registers. We're getting easily over 100 uh, and the engagement is getting much more impactful. So uh, continuing on that idea of these more lead gen type of opportunities, um, we do all other opportunities here uh, to help highlight your product services or company in general. Um, some being a Q&A video interview uh, is one of our primary opportunities, but wherein we have our editor-in-chief, Christian Graf, uh, basically spend about 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes or even more so with you. Uh, we pull in together all the videos and we do a, a, live, a live video interview uh, that we would put on the web, uh, on uh, Gama Sutra. Uh, so it is a great unique way to sort of almost have like a fireside chat type of opportunity. Um, in addition, we one of our most popular items is our sponsored articles. Uh, these are articles in which we take uh, key sort of uh, topics that you are looking to discuss or a mission that you're looking to highlight. You work closely with our editorial team uh, just to make what we always like to do is make sure these uh, these pieces are going to resonate. So. We always try to help craft the pieces or the editorial pieces being a little not too salesy, but more uh, capturing a, a general feel or a, uh, something that's a little more uh, inclusive to everybody in the audience versus one specific uh, segment. Um, so uh, we work very closely on these sponsored articles, but very intense program that uh, provides a lot of great uh, overall uh, traction and, and gives a good, a lot of leads as well uh, for those pieces. Uh, in addition, the native content distribution is very similar, but uh, basically more, at, um, more type of article distribution that uh, blends into to our actual native content. So um, it looks very much heavily like our average, like our own editorially, if you will, but uh, we'll show a part of it that's called sponsored. So again, these are just more sort of in-depth ways in which we can work with you uh, to bring these pieces to life that are beyond just banner advertising. These are more thought provoking pieces um, and have, have been performing extremely well uh, in the last 12 months by far. Thank you, Nick. And um, one second. Um, so as, as you just mentioned, the banner advertising, of course, that is also still possible. And we do have that option. Uh, we uh, utilize them usually internally to promote like uh, other uh, marketing campaigns. Uh, but of course, it's free. We still offer, um, it's still, uh, you're still able to also link to your website if you have like something that you want to promote or new tools coming out or new pro uh, uh, where you just want to drive traffic. So these opportunities are definitely, definitely still there. And as mentioned earlier in the packages that we just outlined, they are uh, usually either all of them or at least a few of these options are already included in, uh, in helping promote and drive traffic to whatever item uh, you're currently launched and whatever helps you to get your message out and get you engaged in front of the community. Um, just as an example and just what, what companies have been doing, uh, a quick case study of what uh, Amazon did last year and we're currently, I mean, fully aware, not everybody is Amazon, um, but uh, I, I, just uh, to outline and show you that there's like, <clears throat> all, that usually companies um, run multiple way, multiple channels to kind of like direct and to approach the community from different angles. And uh, yeah, to, and uh, if you look at the numbers, I mean, over the course of the seven days in total, uh, they had like more than 100,000 engagements uh, with users, which I think is like pretty, pretty interesting and a good result. And that's just limited to the Gamma Sutra community. Um, as we mentioned, I mean, <clears throat> there are ways more um, opportunities, and I'm happy to discuss. That, um, later on uh, with you and please reach out you will find my contact details in the slides um, if you have any questions if you are, are wondering about the other possibilities there are lots of opportunities uh, I don't want to uh, miss the opportunity to also inform you about like upcoming events which is now next week uh, our GDC showcase event which is a free to attend an all digital um, conference uh, which we yeah, launched uh, and which we run kind of like in the in the spirit of that uh, March is GDC time and 
we were very, very sad and um, yeah, disappointed last year when we had to cancel it on a short notice for obvious reasons. And to play it safe, we were planning and hoping to host a hybrid event this summer in July in San Francisco, which we just also announced that it will also be only an all digital event. Uh, simply because of the reason, and that's also part of the latest development over the last year, as GDC has become more and more international, and even though it might be able, uh, and from health and security standards within San Francisco to run an in-person event, uh, we didn't feel comfortable in having people, having audience, exhibitors, attendees, uh, partners uh, flying out and maybe have to be quarantined before coming to the event or leaving the event. And so that's why we said like, well, okay, we we'll take another one, <clears throat> another round of a virtual event, which would be great, which we're currently planning on and finalizing. So the options, the exhibit options and sponsorship options will be released towards the end of this month. And we're already very excited how that's gonna be. And uh, there are gonna be some cool features there as well. I can already tell that. And um, also, few sentences because I've had that question now over the last couple of weeks a, a few times uh, being asked, well, why didn't you look at, at a later date? Uh, and that is pretty much uh, for two reasons. Um, there are already a lot of conferences scheduled towards the end of this year. And as mentioned, uh, we want to get rather sooner than later back to our March dates. And by moving uh, the event from, let's say, July to September, October, we would be then uh, too close to our March 22 date, which we plan to host GDC again in San Francisco as a hybrid event with an in-person part and also with the online part to serve the global community there as well. But we hope that traveling, I mean, we all do, that traveling to San Francisco will be able and allowed there again. Unless you don't have any further questions, thank you so much for spending the time with me and for listening to my presentation and to Nick. Thank you. All right, thank you both very much, Luke and 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 Nick, or Luke too. I don't know what we want to call you, but let's, <laughs> that's your name. Let's go for Nick. Thank you for that um, that summary. Really interested. I mean, GDC is is such an integral part of the the video game calendar. You know, it makes perfect sense to move it back to March. That's your time. You know, that's GDC time in March, so it makes sense to get it back there. Interested in the the sort of plans to make it a hybrid event next year. Uh, in March 22. That, that's quite an interesting move. I thought you might have been bolder and said we're going back to a physical event then, but I guess sometimes discretion is better. Yeah, well, I'll say something, you know, I, you know Sam, that, that is still in discussion uh, right now. We are, uh, as of right now, you know, we, we, we were confident in having a hybrid event in July of this year and then obviously made those decisions. If I had to really hedge my bets, I mean, I think March, we are very bullish that we are going to be back as we were in 2019. Um, mm. So uh, that's that's how I would look at it. I think we just are right now covering our bets in case, God forbid, any other uh, announcements come uh, regarding the pandemic in general. Uh, but I honestly believe we will probably be a full uh, full in-person event um, and if anything that uh, if, if there's anything that we've really learned in this last year and a half or year is really just the need though to um, uh, have a, a hybrid event or to be able to capture some of those uh, virtual components. So how that works out exactly, it's something we are working on in, in real time. Um, and we will have more announcements about March 2022 and what that will be uh, really coming up very quickly. Uh, right now, um, as Luke highlighted, we have our March showcase, our GDC showcase uh, next week, uh, which has gone very well so far. Um, and we're excited with that. And then uh, we are geared for GDC 20 uh, this summer for July uh, for our virtual event then. And um, so we do have a lot of momentum on that front and we were really pleased, I gotta be honest, honest with you, being able to announce that we would not be flooring a show in July. Um, I think it just, from a, a sake of clarity and not being too ambiguous, we wanted to just say, listen, this is not looking right. And a lot of the things that went into that um, were the decisions based on uh, what kind of commitment levels we could get from, you know, our, the, the, our large support clients, if you will, of the event. 
In addition, um, it's the challenges that San Francisco in general um, presents itself. It is a little bit more logistically challenging. Um, Northern California has been one of the, the, the main counties that has not opened up as quickly as others, um, and which is fine. But you know, I, I guess I'm saying all this, Sam, in the light that you know, if GDC had traditionally been in Las Vegas, or uh, for that matter, maybe in Florida there would be a likelihood we probably would have tried to floor the event uh, as well, just because there is greater likelihood and freedom for those things to take place there. Yeah, it's, inter it's, a, it's a really interesting thought process. The, the interesting thing from a UK perspective, a UK perspective, is we use GDC as, as you know, our number one event for studios to come and do deals, to meet all of the publishers and platforms that they need to. It's such an important thing. And right. it's quite difficult to transition that into virtual activities um and, and to an extent it's more of a level playing field in virtual because it depends on the audience you can attract and people are going to some virtual events or not to others whereas you can guarantee they'll be there at gdc um let's say you're a uk studio looking for a, a, a publishing partner I know, I know you've got your lead generation solutions you have a really high number of investors and publisher people looking at your site regularly you know what are the what are the easy steps or the easiest steps that a small or medium sized UK studio can, how can they engage with you to raise their profile and try and meet an investor or potential funder through your channels? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, honestly, I, I think, uh, you know, beyond uh, sort of the sales angles that we hi highlighted here where people could, you could, you know, really highlight your company and work with us on those type of opportunities that I did. We obviously have ways for you to engage with our editorial community as well uh, that we can follow up on uh, as in addition. Um, I think for the, uh, the smaller size studios or the studios that are up and coming and, and whatnot and are really looking to get their name out there, um, it is super challenging. And we also recognize the fact that, you know, a lot of the virtual offerings that we have out there, because, you know, it, it, there's only so many eyeballs and so many channels we can have, you know, a lot of those opportunities are um, pricey, you know, if you will, for lack of a better phrase. And so what I would say a lot of times is, and what we're working on is developing ways for up and coming studios or, 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 or game companies, um, more cost effective solutions that are speak to their budget. So um, it, it, what I'm sort of alluding to in many ways is, I think what's so important is highlighting your studio, what you're bringing to the table, what, what you're working on or what you're looking to do, being able to pontificate on that and highlight those things via our channels, uh, whether that be through our, through our virtual event platform, like our sponsored content angles, or complementing that with a virtual presence as well and driving people there. The number one thing we're seeing in, in the entire virtual universe is you have to be able to tie content to your, if you're having a virtual booth. You want to tie it and drive people there. The stickiness that naturally came from being um, in person, people can naturally gravitate to, it takes a lot more uh, effort really to make sure people are stringing along and following the message that you're looking to do. So that's where things like, you know, I, I am working uh, feverishly right now to come up with uh, more cost-effective solutions for these studios that can highlight things that we've done in the past. I mean, obviously we have things like GDC Play, which is truly about up and coming studios and, and, and them trying to break into the industry. But how can we take these and sort of uh, put it on steroids, if you will, to where they can get more amplification. So uh, interestingly enough, we are working this week, actually uh, I have a call tomorrow to talk about that specific opportunity for these sized studios. So I will have more information, Sam, and what we'll do is we will share this directly with you and you can disseminate uh, out to your teams and whatnot, but we will have more opportunities for studios to highlight themselves, to get their name out there, whether it be through Gama Sutra or GDConf or through our virtual platforms. When you're when you're ready to do a profile on the UK and, and showcase some of our leading small and medium sized businesses, I'm the man. And I will uh, connect you to those studios. I think yes, I know it's a, yes. a slightly you know I'm I'm selling back to you here slightly, but in fact, I think it might be an interesting strategy if you look at the globalization of games and the way that different markets are approaching it in different ways. If there was a focus on different markets, I'd love to see what they're doing in in El Salvador with Bill. I'd love to see what they're doing in in Bolivia. All these countries we're not really aware of. I'd yeah. love to see what's going on. 
So when you're ready to talk about the UK, let us know and we'll, we'll make it happen for you. You know, I think that's a spectacular idea. And uh, sorry, Luke, uh, and uh, I think that's a spectacular idea. And it's something we are too very eager with um, to be able to highlight every country pavilion and country that they're what they're doing. <laughs> going on. Uh, we recently had tremendous success with uh, Germans, uh, the, uh, Germany, where we did a whole highlight on the German uh, pavilion, if you will, or, or on the companies that make up um, Col Messi and the, the, the German pavilion. So, um, but we are doing a lot more of that because we realize, yeah, th there's a story to be told. There's reasons that we need to highlight this. Uh, and we will definitely, Yuki, um, just so you know, has always been one of our premium accounts and one we would obviously reach out to immediately. So um, you will be on the short list by far, my friend. Yeah. Uh, Luke, did you have any comments? Sir? So, sorry, uh, is, is yeah. Luke, I just want to quickly j just add one thing in uh, with regards to your question about like small and mid, uh, mid sized studios uh, getting in front of reaching out to investors and publishers. Uh, in a virtual world, it is uh, definitely, um, and I fully agree, it's more challenging. Uh, it is uh, the, the experience that we've seen in the past, like our virtual event, uh, and that's just what I want to share. And I think this is not just like uh, an experience you, you will witness or that counts for a GEC virtual event, but like for, I think, pretty much all the virtual events, is that you have to change your mindset on how to approach when you're exhibiting. And as Nick said, it's like... Uh, people, the attendees of a virtual event uh, are there for the content. That, that's no doubt about that. So it's like really the challenge is like how to get in, uh, engaged. And it is, and you also have to put yourself in the mindset that you're uh, uh, competing from the time wise as an exhibitor to the content and to other exhibitors. So you really have to, and that's a big advantage of an, a virtual event. You can already start pre-event doing a lot of uh, actions, take a lot of actions. You have like, which everybody's always asking about like a full attendees list on an in-person event. Well, actually at a virtual event, you do have this full attendees list and you can already days before reaching out and targeting. And my recommendation is really and our platform is set up like in an, with, a, with an artificial in intelligence uh, systematic where they say that, okay, you're looking for a certain profile of people and you get recommendations of. And so reach out, schedule these appointments. Um, also, the experience, I'm brutally honest there, is not everybody will reply to your appointment. Not everybody will show up even though if they've accepted the appointment. But people and networking uh, comes there. And, and that's kind of like the key takeaway that I had, like uh, we, we ran GDC summer last year as a full virtual event. And that was what, what was setting successful exhibitors apart from people who said like, well, it wasn't really the successful. They said like, well, we have like real um, people canvassing the attendees list, reaching out, confirming, reconfirming, following up on, and they actually got their interactions and they were, I had, Honestly, like uh, as I'm covering like Europe, Middle East, and the Asian market, I had people who were so delighted and he who explicitly specifically asked for hopefully a virtual event only because they had like such a great ROI. I mean, the time investment and the costs with uh, that if you compare a virtual event to like going there in um, in person. I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, from the first place, uh, it's not. It, it is tremendous. So. Um, there uh, and that's something what I really highly recommend doing. And as Nick said, contribute content. Uh, also, in general, maybe from an in-person event or also uh, a virtual event. Uh, participate at a call for submissions. These are great opportunities. They cost a little bit of time. They cost a little bit of thoughts. But once accepted, it's also a great reference. If you've been like uh, called up, it's actually something you can put in your resume. If you've been a speaker at GDC and you come into connection with other peoples, with people from the review board, with other speakers, and it's a great, great network opportunity. And so also use these uh, these items. And it's not just about, and these are not, I'm not talking about sponsored items. Like these are just like contribute to the, uh, to the content and also in a way position yourself as a thought leader within the industry. That's a really nice uh, positive note to end on. Some great advice there, Luke. Thank you very much for that. Welcome. To, to all of our speakers today, uh, Luke and Nick, Bill and Jeremy, and, and of course, Dan from Creative England, um, uh, integral part to make this happen so really appreciate your support but most of all thank you to the attendees that have given up your time on this evening to come and listen to the talks uh, we will be sending you follow-up 
details, a link to the slides and also the recording so that you can um, have a look at this at your own leisure, pick up some more, some more of the insight, but do get in touch with Yuki. We're here to help you. We're here to uh, create opportunities and networking um, opportunities for you to grow your business and meet these new markets. Don't forget next week, we have an event on Tuesday in the morning, nine o'clock, connecting to Chinese companies. We're gonna hear about the latest trends in China, including looking at things like console and PC in China, which are often overlooked. So an interesting opportunity there. And on Thursday next week, a really good guide to getting into uh, the ways to get into the Japanese market. As I said earlier, I feel like a market that's difficult. There are some barriers there, but there are plenty of companies doing it successfully and they're coming to talk to you next Thursday. So go to the UK website and have a look at those and sign up for those events. They're always free. So thank you very much for your time. Have a good evening and hope to see you next week.